today we will talk about the Protista Kingdom. Protists are divided into three groups. So there are the plant-like protists, the animal-like protists, and the fungus-like protists. Like I've said before when we were talking about in the classification unit, protists are like the hodgepodge. So anything that didn't fit in plants or animals or bacteria or fungus kind of got grouped into this. Okay, so we're going to dive in to the different types of protists now. For this, you will need your protist and fungi flipbook. We will begin in tab 1 with Kingdoms Overview. You will record the following information in this tab. So the cell type for protists is they are eukaryotes. So eukaryotes, as you know, have nucleus. Number of cells, they are mostly unicellular. Some are colonial, some are multicellular. Okay. Again, this was the hodgepodge group. Nutrition-wise, they can be both autotrophic or heterotrophic. Okay, again, hodgepodge, and they do have a cell wall, and some have cell walls of cellulose. There are different examples. So for fungus-like, you've got your water mold and slime molds. For plant-like, you've got seaweed and kelp and algae. And for animal-like, you've got your paramecium and your amoebas. Now we will move to tab 3, protist notes section of your flipbook. Again, there are three types of protists. So there's animal-like, which are also known as protozoa. There's plant-like, which is also known as algae. And then you've got your fungus-like, which are also known as your slime molds. Here are some images of some common protists, as you can see. Now we will begin by talking about animal-like protists, or protozoa. And protozoa literally means first animals. So these are unicellular or microscopic organisms, and they're noted for their ability to be modal or be able to move independently. They are heterotrophic, that means they get their nutrition by eating other organisms like bacteria and algae. Some are parasitic, that means they live off of other organisms. And a common one that you probably may have heard of is zooplankton or animal-like drifters. For protozoa reproduction, there are three different uh, way. So one is binary fission where the cell kind of splits in two, which you can see in that first image. The next one is schizogony, which is multiple fission, um, and malaria is an example of this. And you can see that in the image on the bottom that's moving where you can see the cells are just dividing and dividing and dividing. The way I kind of like to think of this is think about like if you're um, blowing bubbles, and when you blow in, you instead of making you know just one or two bubbles, you end up making a whole bunch. Um, so I think of that as multiple fission. And then the last one is conjugation, which we talked about with bacteria. And this is an exchange of genetic material. Okay. And protozoa are classified by how they move. So what is their mechanism for movement? So the first phylum we will look at is the Mastigophora phylum, which is movement using a flagella. Okay. So they swim using flagella. They absorb food through their cell membranes. Okay. And they can be found in lakes and streams um, where they absorb their nutrients from the decaying matter. And they tend to live in the bodies of other organisms as pathogens. All right. Um, so on the screen, you can see an image on top of the bacteria itself. And on the bottom, you can see the fly is not part of the phylum, but it's actually the bacteria that the fly carries. I'm sorry, not the bacteria, the protist the fly carries. Alright, some other examples are ones that cause African sleeping, sleeping sickness, um, they cause uh, intestinal uh, diseases such as guardiasis, things like that. Alright, the next phylum is phylum sarcodina, which they move via pseudopodia, okay? This means they move by a temporary projection of cytoplasm called pseudopods, or fake foots, okay? Um, they're very flexible because they're constantly moving um, and their cytoplasm is constantly moving. And they also use these pseudopods for feeding, which you'll see in just a second. So if you take a look at the image that's kind of moving on your screen right now, you can see the pseudopods are these little guys, um, which are kind of like the fake foot. And as you can see, that's what they use to move. And that's what they're using to trap their food. So they're kind of getting around uh, their food source and kind of trapping it using their pseudopods, right? Um, and that is called phagocytosis, which we talked about as a form of active transport. All right? 
and your representative organism for this is the amoeba. So the amoeba uses uh, the pseudopods for movement. Some other sarcodinas, as you can see on your screen. All right. The next phylum we will look at is phylum ciliophora, and they move by cilia. Okay. And they also use that cilia for feeding, so they can use that cilia to kind of um, move the water or move the food and drag it closer to their opening. Okay. And again, they use that rapid movement to not only move but to get food as well. Okay. And you can see an example of uh, from this phylum is the paramecium, and that is your representative organism. So if you take a look on your screen, you can see an image of the paramecium with cilia surrounding it all around. All right. Some other ciliates are stentor, vorticella, things like that. The next phylum is phylum sporozoans, and these are your intracellular parasites, all right? And these are actually the ones that lead to malaria, okay? And that's carried by a mosquito. The next group of protists are your plant-like protists, which photosynthesize. So algae is your biggest group. Another one is phytoplankton, and the, there are so many of them. They're the major producers of nutrients and oxygens in ecosystems that are aquatic. So phytoplankton are a big part of the aquatic ecosystems. They are eukaryotic. They can be uni and multicellular. They do have chlorophyll, which is the green pigment uh, that helps them with photosynthesis, but there are other pigments. So they are classified by their color. So you'll see the different types of algae as we keep going. So the first one is phylum pyrophyta, which is your fire algae, okay? And they, if you take a look at the image on your screen, the fire algae look at that look like a red tide or that reddish color, okay? But they produce a toxin that can be extremely uh, lethal for the body. So if you see that, don't run into the water. The next phylum is chrysophyta, and this is your golden algae, okay? They are unicellular. An example of this is diatoms, okay? Um, and di, if you know that root word, means two. So they are a two-part shell similar. And these are often found in things that are kind of scratchy, like cosmetics and toothpaste. So anything that has kind of like a gritty feeling will most likely have golden algae in it. The next one is chlorophyta, which is green algae. So kind of chloro from chlorophyll is green. And chlorophyll is the main pigment. So they can be uni and multicellular. They can be found in fresh and salt water. They are very diverse, so there are different examples. So there's spirogyra, fulvox, ova, different ones. Some do resemble plants, but they don't have the plant parts like stems and leaves and roots. They don't have any tissues or any organs either, okay? And these are some examples. Okay, and ova is also known as a sea lettuce. All right, the next phylum is phylum pheophyta. And this is your brown algae. So seaweed and kelp are examples from this. So they're multicellular and complex. And they, again, because of their name brown algae, their pigment gives them a brown color. And another neat thing about these guys is they have air bladders, which you can see in this image over here, those little air bladders. And that actually keeps the algae floating near the surface. So these are the ones you often see on the surface. And the air bladders have sacs, are like sacs of air that help with floating. Uh, kelp is also an important source of iodine, and algin, which is um, from this phylum, is also used to thicken ice cream. So you'll be surprised where you will find algae. The next phylum is phylum rhodophyta, and this is your red algae. Okay, this is your red algae. This is one of the most complex algae. They don't have any root stems or leaves, though. They mostly live in salt water, but they can survive in fresh water. And they have a red pigment, and they're kind of feathery looking. And they're found in food sources, in agar, which we use to grow bacteria, in ice cream, puddings, anything that's kind of thick and, you know, kind of jelly-ish like. All right, and the last thing we're going to talk about with our protists are the euglenoids, which the representative organism is euglena, okay? They are found in freshwater. 
The cool thing about them is that they have both plant and animal characteristics, but they don't have a cell wall. They are unicellular, okay? They do have chlorophyll, which is why they're that green color. And when light is present, they will produce food through photosynthesis, but when light isn't present, they don't have to worry about it. They are able to um, have those animal-like characteristics and consume other organisms for nutrition. So again, you can see this is the euglena. They photosynthesize when there's light, and if not, they will ingest food. You will now sketch the following images in the Protus Questions and Sketches tab of your foldable, which is this tab right here, tab number five. And you can do this by pausing the video or by pulling up the PowerPoint after the video is done. But I will go through these images. So here's an amoeba. You will sketch this amoeba. This is a euglena. You will sketch this. And this is a paramecium, and you will sketch this in that tab. Once you're done with your sketches, go ahead and answer your questions on the Protus Questions and Sketches tab of your foldable. Thank you.